So uh, I'm a low tech guy, uh, and hence no slides. Um, actually, uh, I'm uh, fortunate to follow uh, Jesse uh, for uh, two reasons. Uh, one, uh, I share his obsession with the distortions tax havens create in the international data. And second, uh, almost independently, I'd chosen as one of my uh, uh, case studies uh, Brazil. Uh, but I'm actually going to focus not on Brazil's debts per se, but Brazil's reserves. You know, I, I was chuckling as Jesse gave his presentation uh, because when a Japanese, you know, his, he correctly framed it given this conference as a distortion around developing country data. Uh, but today, when a Japanese investor buys a U.S. CLO, they are technically buying a bond issued by a Cayman's Island shell, and that records in the U.S. balance of payments as a loan from the Cayman Islands to the United States. So there's been a couple hundred billion increase per year in loans from the Caymans to the United States. Uh, and equally the case, when an American investor now buys a CLO, it shows up as a purchase of a foreign bond issued by a Cayman company, which is then making a loan back to the United States. The extent to which tax considerations and flows through shells are driving the international balance of payments today is honestly quite hard to overstate. Uh, but I wanted to focus on uh, two uh, separate points. The first argument I wanted to make is that uh, we need to kind of go back to the past when we think about an analyzing the risk of public debt flows. By go back to the past, I essentially mean go back to talking about a really old indicator, the kind of thing the World Bank tracked in the 1950s, external debt to exports, and drop the current focus, which has been much more directed at public debt. That does have the positive effect of capturing corporate flows, at least if they're accounted for correctly. And then my second point is given the, the the volatility in debt flows and the damage that can come if you borrowed in foreign currency and your currency depreciates, a lot of countries have built up large foreign currency reserves as a buffer. But while I think on the debt side, you should go back to the past, I think when thinking about reserves, it is the interesting uh, financial component today is all the creative ways emerging economies are making use of their reserves to facilitate and transform uh, financial flows, and in some cases, transform currency risk. So one is an argument for simplicity, and the other, in some sense, is an argument for more complexity. First, on the side of simplicity, uh, there's been a, was a recent report that said, you know, uh, there are two great puzzles in public uh, debt, uh, two great outliers. One is Japan, which should be in trouble but is not, and the other is Argentina, which gets into trouble no matter what. The problem there, in my view, is that everyone is looking at the wrong indicator. Uh, Japan has gross external debt of 240% of GDP. Argentina, when the IMF got involved, had ex uh, public debt of 60% of its GDP. How conceivably could Argentina be a risk? You know, Only 60% of GDP had come up from uh, a lower level. But that was focused entirely on public debt. Japan's public debt, A, there's a lot of assets, but B, it doesn't correspond with a history of external borrowing, nor is it in any currency other than yen, nor, in fact, does Japan have any true foreign currency exposure, because Japan, in aggregate, has, and the Japanese government, more foreign currency assets than it has foreign currency debt. So rather than focusing on external uh, public debt, I think we should go back to focusing on the old-fashioned external debt. So first, look at external debt to exports. 
Second, sort of to solve some of the issues that Jesse has raised around the complexities of accounting for uh, offshore borrowing, do a simple sum of your current account deficit over the past five years and compare that to your exports. It's kind of a good little proxy if you're borrowing a lot and your exports aren't growing. Second, look at the currency composition of the debt. Do a binary thing. Are you borrowing in your own currency or someone else's? Simple. And then third, look at your total external debt relative to your total foreign currency reserves. On all of those indicators, Japan scores at a zero risk. And on all of those indicators, Argentina scored as a very high risk. And it was borrowing a large sum. Current account deficit was 5% of GDP. It was exports were very low, 12% of GDP and quite volatile. The currency composition of its debt weighted very heavily towards foreign currency. And by the way, when it was borrowing in pesos, it was borrowing at crazy high interest rates, so it wasn't really helping. And then finally, it had built up and amassed, particularly when Macri went on his uh, bond borrowing binge, far more foreign currency debts than it had foreign currency reserves. Uh, in aggregate, but also if you look at the short-term external debt to reserves ratio. As an aside, I'm not a fan of the IMF's more complex metric, uh, which includes uh, uh, a composite set of measures of reserve need, because for many countries, it suggests countries are safe with less reserves than they have short-term external debt. I'm, as I said, arguing for simplicity and going back to the golden oldies of external debt to exports and short-term external debt vis-a-vis -vis reserves. Second theme, given that most countries correctly do not want to be subject to the set of risks that Argentina has experienced, uh, particularly in the past couple of years. Most countries would rather avoid the IMF. Uh, there has unquestionably been a significant buildup of liquid foreign exchange reserves in the system. And so when a lot of money flows to emerging markets from the portfolio investors around the world, an awful lot of that just goes into reserves and flows right back into US treasuries or to bunds. And in some sense, that makes sense. It reduces the risk of those uh, associated with the borrowing. But it also means that uh, the benefits of the capital flow are much, much, much reduced. Because there are now so many reserves in the system, there has actually been a tendency to be more creative with how those reserves are used. And I don't have a comprehensive theory. So instead of uh, doing a comprehensive theory, I'm going to just offer four examples. The first example is sim simple. It is the problem of too much. And the current problem of too much is most acutely present uh, with Taiwan, which has reserves equal to 80% of its GDP, legacy of persistent current account surpluses of over 10% of its GDP. And its insurance companies have separately put two-thirds of their total assets into foreign assets. And so the insurers have foreign assets of 100% of their Taiwan's GDP, which is an incredible sum. Of that, half is hedged. Of the half that is hedged, I have argued, uh, the Taiwan Central Bank has neither confirmed or denied that I am correct, uh, that half of that is hedged secretly with Taiwan Central Bank which in a weird way tells you something important about a lot of cross-border flows. Some of those cross-border flows into dollars are coming with money that insurers have borrowed from their central bank. And thus, they are going to naturally have to gravitate towards, in currency composition, towards assets which match the currency composition of the supplier's reserves. So that aggravates some of the foreign currency biases. It also means that Taiwan's risk perspective is the opposite of the normal. Taiwan's financial stability would be hurt if Taiwan's currency were ever to appreciate. The open position uh, in the insurers is currently estimated to be about 25% of Taiwan's GDP. So a 20% appreciation 
would roughly wipe out the capital in the insurance sector. Uh, just a different risk. Second uh, interesting case is the case of too many. Lebanon. Kind of is going to be in the news a lot. Lebanon, you think it should be fine. Right? Foreign currency reserves, including the gold, have often been close to 100% of Lebanon's GDP. Surely that is sufficient. Surely that is evidence of overinsurance. But what is missed in Lebanon's case is that those reserves were almost all borrowed reserves. And they were almost all reserves that were borrowed from Lebanon's domestic banks. And so when you look at the net foreign currency position, if it ever were to be disclosed, of Lebanon's central bank, it would be net short dollars because it has actually borrowed more, if you look at the foreign currency deposits on the liability side, from the Lebanese banks than it has in external foreign reserves, with the difference being money that Lebanon's government has lent to Lebanon's, uh, sorry, Lebanon's central bank has lent to Lebanon's government. How would you capture that? Well, you would understand that with the old-fashioned indicators because Lebanon has, has been consistently running current account deficits. Those deficits have taken the form of cross-border bank inflows, in awful cases, deposits. And those deposits, in some sense, are giving people an artificial sense of safety because the deposits were not invested in safe assets or pretty much anything other than indirectly claims on Lebanon's government intermediated through Lebanon Central Bank. The fun cases, the complicated cases, the interesting cases, although Taiwan's kind of interesting. One is Brazil. And I think Jesse has done a great job of uh, illuminating it. In order to manage foreign currency risk and capital flow volatility, Brazil built up close to $400 billion in reserves. And Brazil's government, Jesse's data suggests, has reduced its external foreign currency borrowing to about $100 billion, which creates, a, a, on a narrowly measured basis, a great risk profile. Uh, Brazil is safe, arguably too safe. But because of the surplus in foreign currency reserves, I think Brazil has been able to do two things. One is turn Petrobras loose. All right. So Petrobras showing up in Jesse's data is a private company. It's state-owned. Uh, and in a sense, it's an alter ego for the sovereign. And so you could arguably should be including the sovereign's alter egos, however broadly you want to define that, in your measure of foreign currency exposure. Uh, and that's true across the emerging world. The biggest borrower in Russia have historically been the state oil companies and the state gas companies, biggest foreign currency borrower in Mexico is Pemex, so forth and so on. A lot of private debt isn't really private debt. And therefore, the shift away from foreign currency debt isn't nearly as pronounced. But the second interesting component of Brazil is even if you include Petrobras, Brazil has a, a, a surplus of foreign exchange in the public sector. More foreign currency reserves than foreign currency debts combining Brazil, Petrobras plus the government, which has allowed the government, for better or for worse, to sell insurance, they're called local currency swaps, to foreign investors and local investors in the event of pressure on the RIAI. And it's a relatively safe thing to do if you have excess foreign currency reserves, but it does mean that local currency debt in times of stress transforms into foreign currency debt. And I think this is something that we should all be thinking a little bit more about. Is this good because it mitigates some of the volatility? Or is this uh, a potential shock amplifier? Fourth interesting case, Turkey, one of my favorites. Turkey has very high levels of domestic liability dollarization. So Turkey's banks have about 150 billion in dollar deposits and have lent about 150 billion in domestic uh, loans. So you can kind of ask a simple question. Why would a banking system that is basically matched on foreign currency terms domestically go out and borrow externally? Which they did. They borrowed about 150 billion on top of that externally. 
And if you look at that, that 150 billion, it was kind of going into some interesting places. An awful lot of it was going into required reserves at the Turkish Central Bank. And this Turkish Central Bank created a facility that lets you meet your reserve requirement in Turkish lira with foreign currency. So in a gr some sense, the Turkish banking system became a substitute for government reserves. But the other thing this was used for was to provide collateral for cross-currency swaps, which allowed foreign currency borrowing to be transformed when the world liked lira into lira, which were then lent out. Now, that has an interesting property uh, because in bad states of the world, those swaps disappear. Uh, and in bad states of the world, in some sense, the Turkish banking system gains dollars because uh, it gets the dollars that had previously swapped back. And it suddenly needs lira. Right? So who can supply lira against dollars in a bad state of the world? The central bank, which is precisely what happened over the course of last year on a pretty significant scale. So on one level, this feels like a great financial alchemy. Foreign currency borrowing to the facing the world is being used and transformed to support domestic, domestic currency lending. And in bad states of the world, the central bank can always be the supplier. And in bad states of the world, the banking system's liquidity can be shared with the government through uh, these swaps. But are there risks? Well, in Turkey's case, one of the risks was that the government also was selling foreign exchange. So the apparent stability in Turkey's overall reserves masked a combination of selling your own reserves and getting some of the reserves borrowed from the banks. But all of a sudden, we now have a new potential policy variable, which is the swap rate and a question about whether the government will be providing swap financing, which is the new central element of Turkey's financial system, at an appropriate rate, and whether or not what was an emergency intervention becomes a sustained source of financing and the basis of financial intermediation. Point being that these are quite interesting and creative uses of reserves but they're also giving rise to some interesting and new risks. Thank you.